start church. Okay, could somebody pray? We have an extra mic? Yes. Could somebody pray and then we'll start, please? Jesus, we thank you for this um, wonderful morning that you've blessed us with, Lord. And uh, as we're going to um, dig into your, um, to your word today, Lord, um, in the subject of Christian apologetics, Lord, I pray that we would uh, learn something new today and that, um, Lord, as, even, uh, as we're learning more about you and your word, I pray that um, it would uh, impact us and that we would... Um, increase our knowledge in it and that we'll be able to apply it and uh, thank you jesus that we'll have a good time together in this class in the name of prayer amen. amen okay once again good morning all right so we have been um, talking about the person of jesus uh, we looked at the uniqueness of christ why is christ unique we went through nine reasons or nine statements on that. We looked at the resurrection of Jesus. And then we looked at why we say salvation is only through Jesus. Okay. So today, we want, to just, we want to focus on two things. One is, how do we share Christ with a person who comes from the Hindu faith? And how do we share Christ with a person who comes from the Muslim background? Right? Um, the intent here is not to put down other religions or philosophies. So we are not you know, condemning. But what we are saying is when we share Christ, we need to understand their backgrounds. Uh, how are they understanding things we are saying? Right? And then we need to communicate Christ in a way that will bring them to faith in the person of Jesus. Right? So they need to be very clear what, uh, what the gospel is and what we are inviting them to believe, uh, to have faith in. So let's, um, uh, let me just, and so let me just um, share this on the screen. This is um, lesson number 13. In your notes, it's page 75, and let me share this. All right. So sharing Christ with a Hindu. So just to draw a contrast, or at least to understand um, some of the key beliefs you know, from somebody in a Christian faith and somebody uh, from a Hindu faith. Um, when you talk about God, uh, as believers, we are referring to the one eternal triune God. For somebody from the Hindu faith, they have many gods and goddesses, numerous, right? So each, each family, maybe even each individual, sometimes it happens at a community level, they embrace a certain set of gods and goddesses. So say, okay, here we worship these gods and goddesses. And so, so there's so many. Uh, you know, the number we don't know is about some 330 million gods and goddesses. But what is interesting is they also have this concept of Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. It kind of parallels our Trinity. <laughs> So we have to be a little careful. Because when we are talking about Trinity, they say we also have <laughs> you know, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. So they are thinking, that is their frame of reference. But when we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, we are not meaning the same thing. We are talking about the eternal God. Uh, and uh, triune God one Godhead, but in their minds they could be thinking like this. So we have to be very careful how we talk, how we communicate. Uh, when we talk about man, we say by default man is sinful, but they essentially, I'm talking about the religious uh, philosophy, essentially say man is part of God. 
So there is something of divine in man already. So sometimes you'll hear some of the speeches or writings, discover the God in you. You know, the thing. So it's like there's there's something already of God in you. you know? So so we have to be again careful. Scriptures, we have the Bible, we have the Vedas, Ramayana, Mahabharata, and uh, so on. Jesus Christ. Uh, again, here we have we have mentioned this before. Um, when we say about Jesus, we're talking about God who became man, incarnation. But they will also have similar things. Oh, we also have many avatars. Many times God came. For you only once he came. He came for us many times, you know. So that is their thinking. Right? And also, uh, Hinduism is more like a philosophy where you can embrace anything. So many Hindus will say, yeah, Jesus is also one more God. So I'll take the photo of Jesus, keep, keep the Bible, add it to my collection. They don't mind. They don't mind. You know? Generally, I'm saying, you know, of course, I'm not talking about uh, the radical Hindus, but generally, they don't mind. So if you ask somebody, uh, Hindu, do you accept Jesus? Yeah, I accept. But in what way they're accepting as one of the many gods? For them, it's like, yeah, one more god. Do you respect Jesus? Yeah, of course. So we have to be careful because that is not the way when, when the Bible is telling us to believe in Jesus, when the Bible is telling us to accept Jesus. It's like no one else. He, I, he is the only Lord and God. You'll have no other gods beside me, is what the Bible is saying. So we have to be careful, right? Life's purpose uh, for us, he says, okay, to know God, be through a personal relationship. God establishes relationship with us, then we grow in that knowledge. Whereas here, it is of attaining something through your good works, through a process of enlightenment, you attain something, and eventually you should escape the cycle of reincarnation and uh, experience moksha and nirvana, which is being united with God. So, Heaven, in, uh, for us, heaven is a real place where God dwells. And for us to go be with him, uh, in Hinduism, it's more of a process of escaping the cycle of uh, reincarnation and becoming one, united with God. Hell, it's a place of separation. But in Hinduism, uh, it's being here on earth and being trapped in the cycle of reincarnation. That itself is hell. So again, we have to talk, think carefully. When we say born again, you must be born again. Yeah, I was born again 100 times. <laughs> but they're thinking born again in a different way. Say born again, we are saying you're receiving life from God. For them, born again is a cycle of rebirth. Very different things. But the term seems almost close to each other. I actually mean very different things. So when we say born again, we have to be careful, right? So essentially, uh, uh, with this understanding, right, uh, we have to be careful what terms we use and how we speak to somebody who's coming from a Hindu faith. Uh, because we may use terms, but they, it is understood differently because of their background. Right? It's understood. So we have to make it very clear, very simple, how we communicate. Some other things that we need, uh, uh, must keep in mind is uh, things about the caste system. Uh, it is true that you know, uh, for, for many, many, many years, uh, uh, there's been attempts to so-called abolish the caste system, but it's still part of their thinking. Right? Generally, they would like to marry somebody from their own caste. And, Things like that. It's, it's like it's still there, it's still prevalent. Uh, uh, things like that. Um, we mentioned about reincarnation, yoga. So yoga itself is a it's a form of spiritual exercise. So it's not just breathing exercise, physical exercise. It is a spiritual thing, right? Uh, and then different kinds of yoga with the intent of bringing certain kinds of benefit, spiritual benefit. Uh, for the individual who's practicing those things. 
Um, karma, which has to do with actions, deeds, you do a lot of good deeds, those are your actions, which then will determine what happens to you. Uh, dharma is the goodness or righteousness you get from doing those good deeds. Avatars are human forms of uh, God, uh, Vishnu. Uh, so, how, given this background, uh, so very sound, I'm not saying we should try to understand Hinduism fully, it's just at least you have the main ideas, right? I have a main idea. So, given this background, how will we share the gospel clearly without? You know, getting them to misunderstand what we are saying. So, the first thing is the existence of sin and evil, they will readily agree. Yes, there is sin, there is something called doing evil. Most Hinduism and Muslim, Islam or Muslims will agree to that that this is evil, this is sin, this is something that does not please God, right? Uh, they will agree to it. Uh, but when the Hindu is thinking about sin, he's thinking more about in the context of how it affects me in my karma. When we think about sin, we're thinking about how it affects our relationship with different. So when we sin, we feel sorry because we have offended God. When a Hindu sins, okay, tomorrow I have to do two more good works. I have to compensate for it. Now I told a lie, it's okay, tomorrow I'll tell two truths. Compensation, right? So that is the thing, karma. I'm thinking, okay, I, I know there is sin, I know there's evil, but the Hindu is thinking by default, okay, uh, how does it affect my overall karma, net result? Not thinking about how it's affecting my relationship with God. Very different how we perceive sin, or a believer will perceive sin, and how a uh, Hindu perceives sin. We agree on the concept of sin, we agree on the concept of doing wrong, but what impact it has, that is quite different. So for us, We need, as we begin our conversation, our emphasis must be on how sin affects our relationship with God. Same thing when you talk to a Muslim, we'll, 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 we'll see in the next lesson. That also is important. Hey, our sin is not just affecting us. Of course, you know, we will suffer the result of our wrongdoing, but it's affecting relationship with that you have to make them understand, make them think about. Right? That there is a God who loves you, but our sin affects our relationship with God. Second, so that leads us to a discussion on forgiveness. How are you going to be forgiven for this? Uh, we ag agree that our sin has its consequences, right? We agree that. Uh, because we sin, there will be uh, consequences. But the Hindu is thinking in terms of, well, uh, if somehow my wrongs, the wrongs I have done outweighs is more than my good, I'll just get another chance next time, in next life. Next time when I come, I will make, I'll try to do better. Reincarnation. But we are saying, no next chance. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 is an important scripture to remember. Right? Say, so, hey, the Bible tells, this is where the Bible is different. The Bible says, it is appointed to man once to die, after that comes the judgment. It means you die once, not two times, ten times, twenty-five times. You die once. Then there is judgment. You have to stand before God. God is going to judge you. And uh, what will happen to sin? Even one sin on judgment day is enough 
to dismiss us from the God, presence of God because God is perfectly holy. So we have to bring in that concept, right? Sin affects a relationship with God. The consequence of sin is not that you're going to go on in the cycle of reincarnation, but you have to, when you die, you can be judged. And even one sin will prevent us from getting into God's holy presence. God is absolutely holy. So they'll accept that as well. God is absolutely holy. One sin is enough to get me away. So then we bring the issue of forgiveness. How can we receive forgiveness? How can we receive? And that is where we have to introduce the uniqueness of Jesus. That there is no way any man can wash away our sins. So in the Hindu philosophy, there is lots of ideas on how you can wash away your sin. One is you go dip in the river. Or you go on some pilgrimage, or you do some sacrifice. A lot of different ideas. Or if some uh, god, ma god man, or guru, or god woman, some mata, you know, uh, is does some prayer and blesses you, something like that, your sins will be forgiven. But then that's where we have to say, look, see, every man, every man has sin of their own. We're not saying they not, may not be good or they may be better. They could be better than others, but every man has sin of their own, whether it's a, a guru or a... Yeah. Right. So this is where Jesus... Why is Jesus unique? Because he's not man who tried to become God, but it is God who became man. Very different. Not some man who's trying to be good and good and good and then attaining enlightenment. It is God who became man, and he was sinless. That's why we can say he was sinless. It is not man trying to become God, but God became man. He was sinless. Right? So that's where uh, everything becomes different. Everything becomes different. Right? And then we talk about the death, the purpose of Christ's death. He paid for all our sins. The sinless one took all our sins on him, and the judgment for the sins of the whole world was put upon him. He died, he buried, he was buried, he rose up again. And today, if you believe, the Bible says forgiveness is free. And you can have forgiveness here and now. You don't have to hope that you know you keep coming through the cycle of reincarnation, and then sometime you, you'll go some. No, you can have forgiveness here and now. Right? And God is, brings us to a personal relationship. We come into a personal relationship and very important it is god who works in us to change us because even the hindu mindset is you must change yourself and the you must gain knowledge and you must do works and you must change yourself that is the hindu mindset right but here it is we're saying god works in us to change us and make us like him so these are the main points of difference you with me? Yeah. So very simple. Right? So we won't confuse them with Trinity. Don't confuse them with, you know, being born again. All that. If we've used those terms, they'll get confused. So you don't even use those terms. Don't say Trinity. Don't say must be born again. When you're speaking to a Christian crowd background, you can say you must be born again because they have that. When you're speaking to a Hindu crowd or a Hindu person, Avoid using those terms because it's very confusing. Just make it very simple. Focus on sin, relationship with God, punishment for sin, how you can receive forgiveness, why Jesus is so different, and how Jesus can change your life here and now. You can have that. Very simple. They will understand. They will see the difference. Clearly, this is very different from my Hindu faith. Very different. This is so good. Any questions? Yes.
Francis, Nigel, question? Because in my school time, I'm sharing like like as this. To one of my not friend is a group of friends. Okay. A group. Uh, group. Yeah. So all are Hindu background. Mm -hmm. So uh, most of the, these things I shared, but last one topic came like as this. So you are saying our God is not God. You, you only your God is like I got afraid. <laughs> hey, okay, now he's gonna do beat. <laughs> so, like, I, I, that time I said like this. I'm not saying your God is not God. What I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what I'm saying about my God. So, what I can do, like, in case like the situation is happening, like, okay, you are saying like as this. So, how to overcome, like, in case like most of the crowds are coming. Okay, you are saying. Um, like it's gonna to be an argument or anything so how we can say like, yeah. in a proper way yeah so i think from the beginning uh so uh, i mean if it yeah let, let me say this um from the beginning we start with the term god right so like god we agree we believe there is a god and it, it should not be as though uh, us versus them or Christians versus Hindus. It's not like that. God is there. God who created all of us. God created all of us. And now we are all sinners. We are all sinners. So we are saying, look, we are talking about us as a common thing. Yeah. So if we start like that, God created all of us. We are all sinners. We have all done things. So when we use that, you know, making say, look, this is applicable to all of us. So from the beginning, they will think that they, they will be uh, under, they will understand that this message is for everyone, all of us. But even if it eventually comes to what you just described, like they feel like, oh, you're now telling that your God is better than our God or things like this. Hey, no, 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 that's not the point. The point is. You and I are same. We are just human beings. How are we, you and I, sinners, going to find the God who created us? So I'm not saying my God or your God. I'm saying the God who created you and me. So we can say that. So the moment they say, hey, you're, just, you're saying... My God and your God. No, no, I'm not. I'm saying I'm talking about you and me. I'm talking about all of us. We are sinners. How are we going to find the God who created you and me, created all of us? So now we are not saying my God or your God, the God. How? Oh, and leave it at that. And of course, uh, the moment it comes into some sort of uh, us versus you, um, kind of thing. You just have to keep quiet. We don't want to get into a fight and a debate and things like that. Uh, so we leave it like this. And then if there are individuals or people who have sincere questions, they're not fighting or they're not taking it uh, as a us versus you argument, but more of, um, no, I, I have a sincere question about why Jesus was born in Jerusalem? Why he was not born in Mumbai? Sometimes they have, why, <laughs> why not here? Sincere question. They're not asking it uh, uh, to challenge us, but generally, why why you have to bring God from Jerusalem to here? <laughs> Sit here. Then we have we, have, we can explain. You know that God had to choose somebody to come, some place to come. Because if he was born in I don't know, Bangalore. Somebody is staying somewhere and say why he was born in Bangalore, why he was not born there. So that question can come from anywhere. God had to choose one community, one place to be born. And it happened that he chose Israel, Jews in Israel. I mean, if people ask sincere questions, good. If they come to fight and argue, just leave it. Good. Another question. Go ahead. 
same situation also so what happened after that is one of the whole witness boy is there so we both are like fighting like uh, he is saying right i am saying right he directly came and said jesus is not there jesus he is saying all false and all so like in practical time as if we are going to do ministry so in case like as that decision happening like they are saying uh, wrong we are saying right jesus is not there and if anybody is like want to receive to jesus like this kind of uh, things are coming to their life so how we can say and correct them yeah so that's a very um, bad situation where especially when you have somebody like say from a jehovah's witness the example the, the the hindu person will not know difference between jehovah's witness and us they are both christians you yourselves are fighting what's wrong with you <laughs> but he doesn't understand that the jehovah's witness is actually a cult it's not the genuine christian faith right and he won't understand that so that's a very bad situation to happen if it does happen say hey uh, you know i am stepping out of this if any of you are interested you can come and meet me separately we'll talk because we shouldn't fight in front of the other party in front of you know jehovah's witness thing because they they the jehovah's witness will not accept that jesus is god the very basic thing is gone and there's no need to fight about this so just say hey yeah uh, please excuse me if any of you are interested you can come and meet me personally somewhere else we'll talk but i am not interested i will not continue in this conversation just leave it and go away because it will not go anywhere argument and then they'll watch they laugh at us yeah who was five how can we actually debate or clarify on that meaning there's one god one mediator between god and man the man christ jesus so you can say yeah, that that is true that means it's talking about the mediatorial role the role that jesus played as a man when he became a man that does not take away from the fact that he was god it's just saying this is what he did as a man as a man he became the one who can connect us or bring us back to god but who was this man he was god who became man and as a man he is bringing us back to god so can you see that is very clear indication that he is god because only god can bring us back to himself if if he was just man then he's like any of of us then he is no better than me or you trying to reach god if he was just man but if he was god who became man then he definitely could be the mediator who was taking man to god so that is but it's really focusing on his role as the redeemer the mediator but that doesn't take away from who he was as god yeah. and what he has you know after his ascension he is seated at the right hand of the father he is god any questions from online students yes so the name uh, because my uh, most of the hindus keep this name and uh, each name has different uh, meaning uh, vishnu this is sustainer shiva is a destroyer so most of the hindus they'll keep the name after coming for after their salvation also they they don't change but whatever that the name itself the it's a meaning when jesus also the uh, given a name what name you have to keep for the child say any particular about changing the name and uh, uh, shiva means a destroyer they never the then uh, that will affect on their life because david says that i will never uh, confess any other gods in my mouth 
but what about uh, this? Um, so the question is, should somebody change their name after becoming a believer? And this is my opinion. I mean, I can't, I don't know if there's a chapter and verse to use uh, in responding to this question. But I think uh, this is just my thought that uh, it really doesn't matter. You know, uh, that you just keep whatever name, but you're using, you're looking at it as a label, not as a definition or a description of who you are. It's just a label, meaning you call me, this is my name. It's a label. But who I am is who I am in Christ. That's my identity. That's who, that's where my life comes from. And that will not be affected by what label I put. Now I can ask you, John, Mary, Sue, whatever label anybody puts on their name. It's just a label. You know? But who you really are, who you are in Christ. That's the real person. Huh? So I, uh, that's my personal thought, that there's no need to change the name. If somebody wants to change, they feel like, I want to take a name of David or Isaiah or Ezekiel or you know, Jeremiah or something. Okay, fine. <laughs> you take that name if they feel they want to. If they want to keep their old name, it's fine. doesn't matter. It's so a problem with changing names. If you especially have a lot of documents, you have to go and change the name and all those documents. That's a big headache. David. And I was thinking that David is in Hmm. Yeah, it's very confusing. You know, here a lot of paperwork if you want to change the name. Hmm. Then you want to change your name, Anna? <laughs> I think she tried for 10 days. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Fine. That's um, so. You know, so that's talking about uh, when you're sharing with a Hindu, right? The goal is keep it very simple so that it's not confusing to them. And you're addressing the main thing. The main. Now, when we share Christ, or when we are sharing Christ with a Muslim, yeah. Uh, is there any uh, question? Uh, they have, they have been... Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of people, especially you know, during my early days when I was sharing, at those, those days, of course, we do, we should do a lot of one-on-one -on -one evangelism. So that's when. Then after that, you you know started doing all these from big stage and preaching to crowds and all of this. That's a little different. Um, so one-on-one, -on -one, uh, and I think uh, it's just keeping it as sim simple like this, and not getting complicated. Because after they come to the faith, then they will learn about Holy Spirit, you know, uh, all the, the the actual, the triune God and so on. But then even the different names of God, of the Lord Jesus, the titles were given to Jesus. They will learn all that. They will understand. Somehow the understanding comes. So, so some of the Hindu friends, that uh, that I've led to the Lord are are actually serving God, like you know, serving God today. They're pastors, serving God. So um, it's wonderful to see that happen. And but it's very simple, nothing complicated. Yeah, that like like just like I share share the gospel. Would you like to receive Christ? Yeah. Then as soon as you receive Christ, I give them a New Testament, and say you start reading the New Testament. Then they will start learning about the life of Jesus, and of course. Uh, we lead them into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what I noticed is after they make the commitment to Christ and they start reading the New Testament, some of these questions about this confusion about Trinity and all is not there. It just God gives them the understanding. You know, that, oh, God the Father, I can call God my Father. I, uh, I want the Holy Spirit to work in my life. So, so 
Ah, it's fine. And now even in, in church these days, when I see, uh, like, of course, what's happening these days is uh, these are people who are from the Hindu faith, but they already believe in Jesus, and then they come to church. They come to church. Even there, it's amazing because they're so, they, they understand, they receive, you know, uh, the truth about the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, or all the different titles of Jesus. Oh, they understand. Yeah, this is who Jesus is. There's no confusion that uh, just because there are, you know, example, uh, 10 different titles of Jesus doesn't mean there are 10 different versions of Jesus. That confusion is not there. Now, we know it's the same Jesus. It says that he has different titles. He's called the Good Shepherd, the Light of the World, the Bread of Life. You know, so, all that. So, uh, I think in my experience, the best thing is keep it very simple. Like how we said just now. Just say that. That is enough. Particular things that when we are sharing to urban people, urban people and rural people, the people who are educated and non educated Is there any particular points to touch uh, when we are sharing on the first time? Uh, now, I haven't done like uh, too much of rural. I mean, the village areas, the, the times when I used to do villages, it used to be mainly in crusades, like meetings, you know, so then there'll be crowds of people in front of you. And of course, everything is being done through an interpreter. Um, so those in those meetings, the emphasis is on the healing and the miracles. Okay. We present Jesus, again, similarly like this, present Jesus as the one who died for our sins. A simple gospel, very simple gospel message. Uh, and then present him as the one who heals and delivers. So somehow in the villages, uh, that to them is the sign that what we are saying is true. In the city urban context, it's more of if I understand what you're saying is correct, I will follow. Right. So, so in the urban context, we have to explain it very clearly. Start like the whole starting from a relationship with God created us and relation of some. Uh, if they understand that very clearly, okay. In the rural context, preaching in the in the gospel crusades, it's been more of. This is who Jesus is, but here's the evidence, which is, okay, we'll pray in his name, and there'll be healing and deliverance. Then it's a sign for them that uh, I will follow this Jesus. So that's what... Uh, okay. Now, even in the urban context, um, signs, are, signs and miracles are important. There are people who will respond to that. But um, it's it's important for them to understand, you know, logically what we are saying. Okay, any questions? All right. So what we were going to do? Oh, okay. So let's now just um, look at the next lesson. Okay. So Chaya, uh, there's a chat message on the chat. Sometimes when we send verses to any of our family members to comfort them in times of need, they get encouraged. But when we tell them it's from the Bible, they don't want to accept. How to deal with this? Well, um, we do have to tell them from where the source is, that is, it's from the Bible. Um, if they don't want to accept, then I think we shouldn't force it. Like, don't force it on them, because then it, they, it will push them further away from receiving, you know, or, uh, or being open. So I think if people say, hey, I don't want it, then I think we should respect that and just don't keep, keep don't continue sending uh, Bible verses or things. If they have told you, I, I don't want uh, it is one thing, I mean, maybe they are interested, but just that uh, they may not accept, you know, they may not immediately respond to the Bible. So if they're open to receiving it, they don't mind you sending the scriptures, Bible verses, then you can continue sending it. 
But if they tell us, tell you directly that please don't send me Bible verses, then we must respect that request and don't send it to them. Right? So it really depends on how that response comes. Uh, we need to respect people. And uh, if they are willing to continue receiving the Bible verses, but just that they're not willing to go to the Bible, that's okay. You just keep saying the Bible verses because at some point they may get interested and say, okay, can I read the Bible? So it really depends how they're responding. So, when we talk about sharing Christ with a Muslim, it's a little um, challenging because, again, we have to keep in mind that there are different kinds of Muslims. There are different kinds of Muslims. See, right now, think of what's happening in the Middle East, you know, this, this war between Israel and Hamas, which is a group among the Palestinians who are militant, um, they're all Muslims. And this, this has been going on for a long time. So all, since 1948, there, are, there have been constant fights. Uh, and I, and there's, a, there's a book that came out. It's a book, it's, the title is called The Son of Hamas. It was written by the son of, I think it was the very first or the earliest, among the earliest leaders of the Hamas group. So we're going back to the early days, uh, so 1940, 1950s on. So this young man was the son of one of the leaders of the Hamas uh, uh, militant group, son of Hamas, I forgot his name. And he shares in that book how he encountered Jesus Christ, how he came to faith in Christ. So for him, he was looking at all that the Hamas were doing, that all the activity, terrorists, bombing, killing, uh, all of that. And he was then and during that time, there were people in Israel, like he, you know, used to walk around, and then the people came and gave him a New Testament to read. He started reading a little bit quietly, secretly. He's a son of the leader. There is. And uh, anyway, the book describes a lot of things, but uh, he began to see the difference in the Jesus. And the violence that was, you know, that's kind of uh, almost encouraged in Islam. I saw the difference. And eventually he came, he gave his life to Christ secretly. But then he had to leave, you know, so he escaped into... Uh, he had to leave. He had, he, he, I think he's somewhere in the U.S. But his life is, you know, it's very. He, he could get killed if people know where he is and what he's doing. Yeah, because uh, he's become a follower of Jesus. But what I wanted to say is th uh, that difference, right? Uh, it's not easy for people to see because one is both. So Christianity came out of Judaism, and Judaism, uh, Islam and Christianity kind of trace their roots back in a similar way, not exactly the same way, but in a similar way, you know, all the way to the Garden of Eden, Abraham, and all the way into the Garden of Eden. So it's almost looking like, hey, Islam, Christianity, are like uh, almost same. And in Islam, they are very, I'm again talking about the traditional Muslim, um, is very, what to say, I, I'll use the word trained in their faith. Very strong. Now, there are modern Muslims who do not like what is going on, the, the militant part of Islam and all that. So 
they are slightly different. They are more open. I, they, they, they agree, yeah, hey, we shouldn't be killing people and all those things. They agree to those things. Um, but I'm just saying the, the, the traditional Muslim is pretty well trained in their disciplines. So they will ask questions like, you're saying Jesus is the son of God. How can God have a son? Who was God's wife then? They're trained to ask those questions. You say Jesus rose from the dead. How you know he rose from the dead? The disciples just stole his body and put it in the tomb. They don't believe you know, in, the, in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. So they're trained to ask those questions. So it's a little bit more difficult when we are um, um, sharing Christ with the Muslim. But there are some key points, key areas, and how we can present uh, the message of Jesus and how they will open up to um, the gospel. Okay, so we'll take a break, and when we come back from the break, we will um, we'll highlight those key key areas and how to share Christ with a Muslim. <laughs> 